Hello and welcome to Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. Today I'm going to analyse Jane Austen's hilarious novel Northanger Abbey. In particular, I want to examine the way that Jane Austen textually structures miscommunication. Characters miscommunicating is a theme that runs throughout Jane Austen's novels, as it does centrally in Northanger Abbey. And in fact, Jane Austen has the narrative voice explicitly joke about language and misunderstanding and miscommunication throughout the text. So as a great example, I think, um, Catherine says, when she's having a conversation with Henry Tilney, I cannot speak well enough to be unintelligible, to which Henry responds, bravo, an excellent satire on modern language. So the narrative voice is picking up and asking readers to think about the way that language is used to be unintelligible <laughs> often in the case of Northanger Abbey, but also how people um, try to communicate and sometimes fall short and sometimes fail to uh, convey what they mean, even if to them what they mean seems perfectly obvious. And I'm going to look at a particularly funny, I think, example of that today. Today I'm going to look at a specific example of Jane Austen's use of language making characters unintelligible uh, to one another, in particular John Thorpe and Catherine Morland. In chapter 18 of Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey, Catherine Morland meets up with her new, very best friend, Isabella Thorpe, who has recently become engaged to Catherine Morland's brother, James Morland. Isabella Thorpe's brother, John Thorpe, is the new best friend of James Morland. Um, they are both students together at Oxford. And the foursome have recently been frolicking around Bath together and going on ill-fated carriage excursions, for example, to Blaise Castle. John Thorpe has led Catherine to believe that Blaise Castle is the oldest castle in the kingdom. Now, they don't actually get there um, on, on the kind of escapade that they go on because it's really far too far away from Bath to get there um, given the time they set out and so on. But so you've got kind of that element exposing John Thorpe for the reader. But the knowing reader will also be aware that Blaise Castle is in fact far from being the oldest castle in the kingdom, Blaise Castle is actually an 18th century folly, built in 1766. So when Northanger Abbey was composed in the 1790s, it was only a few decades old, far from being the oldest castle in the kingdom. And of course, the knowing reader, for the knowing reader, this will set up um, expectations of the Gothic and the modern that Catherine will then go on to experience when she actually goes to Northanger Abbey. But going back to what we're talking about today and miscommunication. So one morning Isabella Thorpe tells Catherine Morland, I have just had a letter from John. You can guess the contents. No indeed I cannot. My sweet love do not be so abominable abominably affected and this of course is from Isabella Thorpe of all people perhaps one of the most abominably affected characters in all of Austen. My sweet love do not be so abominably affected what can he write about but yourself? You know he is head over ears in love with you. With me? Dear Isabella nay my sweetest Catherine this is being quite absurd Modesty and all that is very well in its way, but really a little common honesty is sometimes quite as becoming. Again, this is very ironic given that it's coming from Isabella Thorpe. I have no idea of being so overstrained. It is fishing for compliments. Again, this is from Isabella. His attentions were such as a child must have noticed. And it was but half an hour before he left Bath that you gave him the most positive encouragement. He says so in this letter, says that he has as good as made you an offer and that you received his advances in the kindest way. And now he wants me to urge his suit and say all manner of pretty things to you. So it is vain to affect 
ignorance. Catherine, with all the earnestness of truth, expressed her astonishment at such a charge, protesting her innocence of every thought of Mr Thorpe's being in love with her and the consequent impossibility of her having ever attended, intended to encourage him. And this is from chapter 18. So obviously we have here a significant uh, miscommunication, an example of a very significant miscommunication. And who is correct? Had John Thorpe effectively proposed to Catherine Morland? And how could it be that John Thorpe had proposed if the supposed recipient of the proposal had no idea about it at all. To understand this a little bit more, we need to turn back a few chapters to the actual proposal scene to chapter 15. James Morland has just proposed to Isabella Thorpe. This is on their subsequent successful addition to, uh, expedition to Blaise Castle. And she is now the happiest creature in the world. And when Isabella tells Catherine about their engagement, the narrative reads, the happiness of having such a sister was their first effusion, and the fair ladies mingled in embraces and tears of joy. So I want to pay attention quickly to Jane Austen's use of diction here. You can tell that it's very overblown. It is the language of sensibility typical of the kinds of novel that Jane Austen pokes fun at throughout Northanger Abbey. So in the famous defence of the novel section in chapter five, the narrative voice had even referred to such novels as effusions of fancy, which were regarded as trash by condescending reviewers. So the narrative voice in that section, the defence of the novel section, reads, let us leave it to the reviewers to abuse such effusions of fancy at their leisure. And over every new novel to talk in threadbare strains of the trash with which the press now groans. So Isabella's and Catherine's effusions of fancy, then, should make the reader's ears prick up. We've had this defence of the novel section and the narrative voice defending essentially effusions of fancy and here now later in the very novel that the defense happened in we're having these two characters sort of show their effusions of fancy so what might readers ears prick up about about um about this well first readers might be reminded of the cultivated affectation of Isabella Thorpe and the falseness of her language of sensibility, the language of effusions of fancy that come from the novels that Isabella likes to read and that are also influencing Catherine Morland. Isabella in some ways adopts the language of those novels um, in a way that Catherine Morland doesn't quite understand. Um, and that's something that John Thorpe tries to utilise too, I think, as we shall see in the supposed proposal scene. I think it should also alert readers to the novelistic gothic undercurrents that are operating with the Thorpes, which also come into play in the proposed, um, the supposed proposal scene. So you can see John Thorpe in some ways as a kind of comic rendering of the familiar gothic villain. For example, in the plot of him having kidnapped Catherine Morland in his carriage. So when they are going off on this trip to Blaise Castle, she asks him to stop the carriage and he only laughs and drives on faster. And he even whips his horses for good measure. A trope of Gothic literature is the naive, innocent heiress seduced by an unscrupulous fortune hunting man. And that is how, with one eye, we can read the scene that then unfolds. That is after uh, Isabella and Catherine have expressed their effusions of fancy. That is, we can see John Thorpe as a kind of gothic comic, gothic villain. 
As we later learn in the penultimate chapter, so that's in chapter 30, in a fit of self-aggrandisement, John Thorpe imagines that Catherine is the acknowledged heiress, uh, the acknowledged future heiress of the Fullerton estate. So the Allens are wealthy and childless and Catherine is under their care in Bath and they treat her with parental kindness. So John Thorpe assumes that Catherine must be due to inherit Mr. Allen's Fullerton estate. The narrative voice observes damningly, I would say, of John Thorpe, with whomsoever he was or was likely to be connected, his own consequence always required that theirs should be great. And as his intimacy with any acquaintance grew, so regularly grew their fortune. In other words, as the Thorpes get closer to the Morelands, John Thorpe, because of his own vanity, amplifies their wealth because it shines well on him, he thinks, to be hanging out with people who are wealthy. So the, the closer they get, the more wealthy he sort of imagines that the Morelands are and the more he tells other people that the Morelands are wealthy. So the, the, the wealthier he imagines Catherine, the more he wants to marry her. So as the narrative voice says, with whomsoever he was or was likely to be connected, his own consequence, his own vanity always required that theirs should be great. So as he comes to see himself more and more likely as being married to Catherine, he sort of um, amplifies how rich uh, and wealthy he thinks she is. And it is this uh, John Thorpe's self-aggrandising uh, delusion of course, that leads to the miscommunication with uh, General Tilney and why General Tilney thinks that Catherine is also an heiress and where that uh, miscommunication, misunderstanding happens. It happens through John Thorpe. So we have that if we look at the text with one eye. With the other eye, however, in the apparent proposal scene that unfolds, we can see Catherine Morland's difficulty in understanding the Thorpes, a family that, despite Isabella's protestations, do not clearly say what they really mean. So I'm going to turn now to the proposal scene between John Thorpe and Catherine Morland, and it shows off Jane Austen's literary skill and control wonderfully, I think. And it's a fabulous example of Jane Austen's ability to weave together a conversation in which the meaning for the two speakers is completely different. And it almost couldn't be more different <laughs> than in this particular example. So you've got John Thorpe, who is in the process of and thinks he has successfully proposed. And then on the other hand, you have Catherine Morland, who is being polite but who basically wants to get rid of him as quickly as possible. She really dislikes him, but of course she doesn't want to offend him because their siblings have just got engaged. So they are effectively going to become extended family. And we remember that after the uh, trip to Blaise Castle with the sort of everyday kidnapping, so a gothic trope converted into the everyday, uh, the narrative voice tells us, she, Catherine, was less and less disposed either to be agreeable herself or to find her companion so. And you can sort of see that very much here in the supposed proposal scene. So as I read through, I want to pay attention to how John Thorpe and Catherine Morland are speaking so beautifully <laughs> at cross purposes and how Jane Austen constructs these two conversations that are running in tandem. So how everything that Catherine says is a reasonable response to her thinking that they are talking about the upcoming marriage of James and Isabella, their siblings, and that she's trying to get him to go away as quickly as possible, but also how John Thorpe could interpret that very same conversation to be encouraging him in a pursuit of her. The text reads, when the contents of the letter were ascertained, so this is James Morland's letter confirming that Mr Morland has consented 
uh, for James Morland to marry Isabella Thorpe. So he has gone back to Fullerton, the Morland's home, the home area, and has written back to say, yes, it's all fine. They've agreed that we can get married. So when the contents of the letter were ascertained, so the idea of Isabella and James, their upcoming marriage is sort of put right at the front of this conversation, preface essentially this conversation. John Thorpe, who had only waited its arrival to begin his journey to London, prepared to set off. Well, Miss Morland, said he, on finding her alone in the parlour, and uh, this is a sort of fundamental part of Regency courting culture, which is that you really have to take your opportunities where you can find them in terms of being alone, because you weren't really, an, un an unmarried young man and an unmarried young woman were not really supposed to be alone together. Um, and so John Thorpe sees this opportunity of finding her alone in the parlour. Um, and just as an example of that, we might think of Mrs. Bennett, for example, in Pride and Prejudice, where she has to sort of organise things to try and get everybody else out of the room so that Mr. Bingley can propose to Jane. And Lizzie just finds it terribly, terribly embarrassing because Mrs. Bennett winks at them all and Kitty doesn't understand why Mrs. Bennett is winking at her. Um, and it's all terribly embarrassing, but it's part of the same culture, essentially, which is that it was difficult to find occasions when unmarried young men and young women could be alone together. So John Thorpe finds this occasion where she is alone in the parlour. I am come to bid you goodbye. Catherine wished him a good journey. She just wants him to be on his way to get out of there as quickly as possible. Without appearing to hear her, he walked to the window, fidgeted about, hummed a tune and seemed wholly self-occupied. And in many ways, in terms of his relationship with Catherine, John Thorpe is often self-occupied and concerned really only with his feelings and not really at all with Catherine's. We might think of, for example, the carriage ride that I've already mentioned to Blaise Castle. And to some extent, I think the first time reader will continue to read this in that way, that John Thorpe here comically doesn't understand that he is really not wanted, that Catherine just wants him to leave. Uh, but being self-occupied, you know, he just doesn't realise that. I think that's how, what the first time reader probably thinks. I think also though, as a, as a kind of aside, but I think it's interesting. We can see some parallels here in this description of John Thorpe with the way that Edward Ferrers is described in Sense and Sensibility when he comes to propose to Eleanor. So in Sense and Sensibility, the text reads, he rose from his seat and walked to the window, apparently from not knowing what to do, took up a pair of scissors. So like John Thorpe, he sort of is fidgeting, he walks up, he walks over to the window and of course they're very different. John Thorpe is a kind of anti-hero in Northanger Abbey and uh, Edward Ferrers is a, a hero of sorts uh, in Sense and Sensibility. Um, but still I think it's interesting that you can see Austen playing with the same kinds of thinking in these two texts that are written uh, or first kind of composed, first conceived of at a similar time um, in the 1790s. That she's using the same kind of imagery and the same kind of language in these two scenes, even though therefore two very different kinds of male character. Um, so Catherine then says, shall not you be late at Devizes? She's really trying to get him to be on his way. So Devizes is a stop off point uh, en route uh, between Bath and London. He made no answer, but after a minute's silence, burst out with a famous good thing this marrying scheme upon my soul. A clever fancy of Morland's and Bell's. So John Thorpe here mentions James and Isabella. And this is, in essence, the um, cause of their misunderstanding, or at least part of the reason for their misunderstanding, because James, uh, because John Thorpe brings in James and Isabella. And so Catherine thinks that that is what they are talking about, that they are talking about the marriage of their siblings. So a clever fancy of Morlands and Bells. 
What do you think of it, Miss Morland? I say it is no bad notion. So John Thorpe brings up the oncoming marriage of uh, James and Isabella as a way of introducing the subject of marriage and then saying, what do you think of it, Miss Morland? And talking about marriage as a notion rather than about uh, James and Isabella in particular. But Catherine doesn't quite pick up on this and she says, I am sure I think it's a very good one. Again, she's thinking in terms of James and Isabella. But we can see from John Thorpe's response that he sees what she says very differently. Do you? That's honest by heavens. So John Thorpe here, we can see from the sort of strength of his language, that's honest by heavens. He thinks that Catherine, Catherine thinks that the notion of them getting married is a very good one. And why he says that's honest by heavens is because he has interpreted what Catherine has said as being quite forward, as saying, I am sure I think it's a very good one. As in, I am sure I think the notion of the two of us getting married is a very good one, is a very good notion. And that's uh, uh, honest by heavens because that would, that would be quite forward for her to have said that because in the culture of the Regency, in the culture of the time, the woman was not supposed to be too assertive in terms of uh, organising or arranging the marriage. They were supposed to sort of wait until they were asked. So her saying, I'm sure I think it's a very good one, he is interpreted by, heaven, uh, by heavens, that's honest, as her saying very straightforwardly, yes, I, I, I think it's a good idea for the two of us to get married, which would be forward for the time. I am glad you are no enemy to matrimony, however. Did you ever hear the old song, going to one wedding brings on another? I say, will you come to Belle's wedding, I hope? So he, in his sort of thinking, phrasing here, he's referring to this old song, which is, I, I haven't come across it as a song. Um, I did research into this. I haven't come, come across it as an old song. It's an old proverb, um, an old saying. Um, and that might also be where some of the confusion comes in because it might not be that it's an old song, just that it's an old saying. But he thinks bringing up this phrase, going to one wedding brings on another, and then saying, are you coming to the one wedding? In his mind then, he's sort of asking, do you want to bring on another wedding? When she says, yes, I have promised your sister to be with her if possible. So he interprets that as her saying that, yes, she does want to bring on the other wedding. She wants to go to the one wedding and bring on the other wedding. Catherine, meanwhile, just thinks she's being polite. And of course, she wants to go to her very new best friend's wedding to her brother. Why wouldn't she go to that wedding? Obviously. And then, you know, twisting himself about and forcing a foolish laugh. I say, then, you know, we may try the truth of this same old song. That is, try the truth of the phrase, going to one wedding brings on another. And that is obviously, <laughs> in his eyes, getting married themselves. May we? But I never sing. Clearly, she has not caught the gist and is politely trying to stop him from encouraging them from doing anything else together at all. She thinks he's saying we can sing a duet together, we can try this old song. And she's sort of politely saying, hmm, yes, you know, may we? I don't sing though. So kind of removing herself from having to perform a duet with John Thorpe because she doesn't really want to do anything at all with him uh, ever again if she can possibly help it after the sort of um, catastrophe of the the kidnapping uh, carriage ride. Well, I wish you a good journey. I dine with Miss Tilney today and must now be going home. She's really, really trying to get rid of him. Nay, but there is no such confounded hurry. Who knows when we may be together again? That's going back to the idea of that they have happened to find themselves alone and that they should take advantage of this opportunity. Not but that I shall be down again by the end of a fortnight. 
and a devilish long fortnight it will appear to me. So here, John Thorpe is trying to be gallant and he's adopting, trying to adopt the, he's affecting uh, the language and the imagery of sensibility. In sort of echoing a sense or trying to echo the language of Isabella, who's much better at adopting the language of all the novels she reads, the effusions of fancy that she reads, and using that language in the way that she describes her relationship with uh, James Morland, and indeed with Catherine too, the, the sort of affected language of emotion, the affected language of sensibility. And here, John Thorpe is, is trying, <laughs> trying to do that. Not but that I shall be down again by the end of a fortnight, and a devilish long fortnight it will appear to me. So he's trying to um, conjure up the image of someone saying, you know, oh, how and I, how can I, how will I ever bear it to be away from you for a fortnight? It's going to seem like such a long time, and how am I going to cope to be away from you? And that sort of imagery he's trying to um, affect. But of course, Jane Austen is kind of comically mocking it and undercutting such uh, effusions of fancy in in the language that she chooses to give him in her choice of diction. So the his use of devilish undercuts the apparent sensibility of that image that he's trying to adopt and trying to cultivate. And we can see that from the next section uh, in Catherine's response. She thinks she's giving just a very reasonable, practical response. Then why do you stay away so long? Replied Catherine, finding that he waited for an answer. So he has sort of proffered what he sees as this gallant uh, observation. I'm going to miss you for a fortnight type thing. And he's waiting for her, likewise, to adopt the language of sensibility and to say something similarly uh, effusive. But she thinks she's just being rational, you know. If you don't want to stay away for a fortnight, then why do you stay away so long? It's her reading of the situation. But he interprets what she has said as her saying that she doesn't want him to stay away for so long. So he, he reads sensibility into her rational, practical question in response to him. So he says, that is kind of you, however, kind and good natured. Now, if we go back to uh, what Isabella says when she brings this up with Catherine, which I mentioned earlier, but which happens later in the novel, she says that John Thorpe has said in his letter that uh, says that he is as good as made you an offer and that you received his advances in the kindest way. So John Thorpe thinks that she has received his advances in the kindest way. And it's that use of kind that I think we can see coming in here too, when he says that is kind of you. And of course, if he had interpreted it in the way that she had meant it, that would not make any sense at all because she's asked a practical question, then why do you stay away so long? And he said, that is kind of you. So he's clearly interpreted her rational question as her, in fact, implying that she doesn't want him to stay away so long. That is kind of you, however, kind and good natured. And this next section, I think, is, is sort of, it beautifully shows off so many of the failings of John Thorpe uh, and the way that Austin constructs, I think, is uh, is really interesting in terms of the kind of duality that's operating just in this short little passage. So, and just watch out for how many times he says good-natured here. That is kind of you, however, kind and good-natured. I shall not forget it in a hurry. Because he's that's also the sort of language of sensibility when you have these uh, sort of charming male characters say, oh, I'll remember that you've said that forever uh, type thing. And here he's saying, I shall not forget it in a hurry. That is her, in her eyes, practical, rational question that he has sort of taken to, to be something um, emotional and an effusion of fancy. So he, 
in this passage we can see that he's sort of trying to adopt the language of sensibility but he but failing he really can't grasp it at all but you have more good nature and all that than anybody living i believe a monstrous deal of good nature and it is not only good nature but you have so much so much of everything and then you have such upon my soul i do not know anybody like you so here we have this kind of construction i think that jane austen sort of reads beautifully which is that he in this moment exposes both his ambition and his vacuity so we can see his ambition in in the hyperbole that he's trying to grasp at when he's sort of trying to play the figure of the lover he's using the language of hyperbole in terms of saying you have more good nature than anybody living and so much so much of everything you know over the top language that he's using here but so he's on the one hand he's got that but it's undercut simultaneously with the sort of comically bland platitudes that he's actually coming out with good nature that's the best that he can come up with is that she has a good nature well having a good nature is of course a lovely thing but it's not really what you would expect in the language of love and his sort of lack of imagination is shown in and how much he repeats good nature kind and good nature but you have more good nature a monstrous deal of good nature and again that's that's um austin using diction diction beautifully to undercut um the effect of what's being said in in a similar way to the way that devilish was used earlier and a devilish long fortnight it will appear to me similarly here a monstrous deal of good nature um so a monstrous deal of good nature, but it's not only good nature that you have, but so much, so much of everything. And then you have such... He cannot think of anything to say. He cannot think of any particular thing that he can pick up on about Catherine that is special to him or that he particularly loves about her or that is particularly unique about her. The only thing he can say again and again is that she is good natured. He literally cannot think of any way in which she is special, but then you have such, can't think of anything. So he changes the subject. Upon my soul, I do not know anybody like you. And Catherine responds, oh dear, there are a great many people like me, I dare say, only a great deal better. Good morning to you. She's really trying to get him out of the door and she's using kind of standard self-effacing language, essentially, that, you know, she's being uh, politely modest. She's using the language that you would expect uh, her to use here. And even someone like Isabella Thorpe might adopt a similar kind of position of being, uh, in Isabella's case, apparently self-effacing. Um, although here, Catherine really does mean it. <laughs> she She's responding very sort of openly and earnestly, you know, because she does think that there are a lot of people who are a great deal better than her. Uh, you know, someone like Eleanor Tilney, for example. And to this, John Thorpe says, but I say, Miss Morland, I shall come and pay my respects at Fullerton before it is long, if not disagreeable. So we should remember that James Morland has just gone to Fullerton to get their parents consent to marry that's the kind of introduction into this scene so john thorpe is here asking to go likewise just as james morland has just done to fullerton to ask for her parents consent to marry this is moving on a pace he's now got to the point where he's saying right i'm going to go to your parents and ask them to consent to our marriage if not disagreeable. So again, he's he's suggesting, you know, do you want me to go and do that? Is that disagreeable to you or agreeable to you? And she then responds, pray do. So he takes this as encouragement. My father and mother will be very glad to see you. Catherine is thinking in terms of James, uh, of John Thorpe being James Morland's friend and of course then the brother of their daughter-in-law but 
you can see why John Thorpe might see this as her saying very much that his uh, saying that he's going to go to Fullerton is not disagreeable to her. So he then says, and I hope, I hope, Miss Morland, you will not be sorry to see me at Fullerton. Oh dear, not at all. There are very few people I'm sorry to see. Company is always cheerful. So she is sort of using the language of bland generalising. And he takes this as evidence of their compatibility. That is just my way of thinking. Give me but a little cheerful company. Let me only have the company of the people I love. Let me only be where I like and with whom I like and the devil take the rest, say I. So for John Thorpe, this is apparently sort of describing their future life together. And I am heartily glad to hear you say the same. But I have a notion, Miss Morland, you and I think pretty much alike upon most matters. And of course, like this is just dripping with irony because at this moment, they are categorically not thinking alike at all about something as fundamental as their future life together. You know, they, they couldn't be thinking more differently here. He thinks he's proposing their future life together and she just wants to get him out of the door as quickly as possible and doesn't even realise that he is proposing to her. Thorpe here really couldn't be more wrong. <laughs> I have a notion that you and I think pretty much alike on most matters. He hasn't picked up at all on the fact that she really doesn't like him very much. She responds, perhaps we may, but it is more than I've ever thought of. And as to most matters, to say the truth, there are not many I, that I know my own mind about. And again, he sees this as a sign of compatibility. By Jove, no more do I. It is not my way to bother my brains with what does not concern me. My notion of things is simple enough. Let me only have the girl I like, say I. Which is what he thinks he's getting at the present moment. Let me only have the girl I like, say I, with a comfortable house over my head and what care I for all the rest? Fortune is nothing. And here is where it turns into something a little bit darker, I think, because throughout Austen, and probably more generally even, when someone says something as absolute as fortune is nothing, I think you have to be on the lookout slightly uh, and a little bit cautious about trusting what they say because and I for example I think a good comparison would be somebody like Charlotte Lucas so in Pride and Prejudice when she agrees to marry Mr Collins the narrative voice couches it very explicitly as her thinking that she wants only a comfortable home that's what Charlotte is seeking in marrying Mr Collins. She wants only a comfortable home. And that same word, same imagery is being used here. Um, with a comfortable house over my head, what care I for all the rest? But Charlotte explicitly, the narrative voice, does not say that she does not care about all the rest. For Charlotte Lucas, it's not fortune is nothing. She wants that comfortable house because she wants the economic security and she makes no bones about that. The narrative voice presents Charlotte as being upfront and open and honest with her feelings about Mr Collins and about marrying him in order to have a comfortable house. I mean, it even says, you know, she met, um, from the pure and disinterested motive of, um, of getting a house. But here, John Thorpe is being very disingenuous. Fortune is nothing. Let me only have the girl I like, say I. So there are those two claims where he's being disingenuous and we know that he can't really like Catherine because he can't even find a single thing to say about her specifically that isn't just that she's good-natured so he's being disingenuous when he says you know that she is particularly the girl that he really likes and that that fortune is nothing now in the middle there's the idea of the comfortable house over my head and that's what makes him different from somebody like Charlotte Lucas, I think, who wants that comfortable house, 
but is not disingenuous about those other two things. She doesn't particularly claim to like Mr. Collins and she doesn't claim that the fortune is nothing. She's upfront and open. The narrative... Now, we as readers, we don't have access to conversations that she and Mr. Collins had with each other and who knows what she said specifically to him when the two of them are in private. But in terms of the narrative voice and what the reader is actually presented with, we are presented with a character who is straightforward and not disingenuous in terms of the reasons for wanting a comfortable house, a, you know, a comfortable home, a comfortable house over her head. So John Thorpe can claim, what care I for all the rest? But Charlotte never makes a claim like that. She, she does care about, she does care about the economics of it. I am sure of a good income of my own, that's not so clear that he is actually. Um, and if she had not a penny, why so much the better? And this again is very disingenuous here because John Thorpe thinks that Catherine is a great heiress and that in fact, really, her fortune is everything. <laughs> and we know that from the, the text I quoted earlier about him getting his um, self-worth essentially from the wealth of those around him and he has got keener and keener and keener on Catherine the more and more that he sort of imagines that she is an heiress and that she will bring wealth to any marriage that they might have so he's saying this to her but it is disingenuous. Probably John Thorpe cannot believe his luck here when she then responds, very true, I think like you there. He thinks that he's managed to engineer a situation in which he has landed, he thinks, a, a rich heiress um, who doesn't care that he is not uh, an heir like her, that he's not due to inherit uh, great wealth and land and so on. Very true, I think, like you there. If there is a good fortune on one side, there can be no occasion for any on the other. So he thinks that she is saying, I'm bringing my fortune here to the marriage, my good fortune here to the marriage, and there's no occasion for any on the other. I don't mind that you are not also an heir. No matter which has it, so that there is enough. I hate the idea of one great fortune looking out for another. And to marry for money, I think, the wickedest thing in existence. So you can see that John Thorpe might have, think, might have thought that he's playing a blinder by saying fortune is nothing because she is now picking up on that same imagery. And to marry for money, I think, the wickedest thing in existence. Of course, we readers know that Catherine is being um, perfectly sort of straightforward uh, and thinking in the abstract here. And she then says, good day, we shall be very glad to see you at Fullen Fullerton whenever is convenient. And that, from his perspective, seems to be very encouraging. She seems to be saying, you know, I will be glad, we will be glad to see you at Fullerton as soon as is convenient for you. So yes, you should come to my parents to ask for uh, ask for consent for us to get married. Just going back to that phrase, and to marry for money, I think the wickedest thing in existence. We do have, again, the kind of uh, hyperbolic language that's usually associated with Gothic fiction of the period, the wickedest thing in existence. So in terms of the Gothic imagery, if this were all true, if this were all the case, then John Thorpe would be doing the wickedest thing in existence because he would be marrying her for money, uh, despite obviously his completely false claims that fortune to him is nothing. And away she went. It was not in the power of all his gallantry to detain her longer. I love that kind of cutting sarcasm there by the narrative voice. With such news to communicate, that is James and Isabella's engagement, and such a visit to prepare for, that is, that she's been asked to Northanger by the Tilneys. Her departure was not to be delayed by anything in his nature to urge. You know, she really just wants to get on with the important things that she wants to be doing. And she hurried away, leaving him to the undivided consciousness of his own happy address. Address meaning that he's, you know, he's 
paid his addresses he's asked her to marry him and her explicit encouragement so the narrative voice gives us a very good insight into what john thorpe is thinking here he thinks that he's been completely successful did john thorpe propose well yes i think he did when you read it through knowing that john thorpe thinks he's proposing you can understand why he thinks that Catherine is actively encouraging his pursuit of her. But it's also clear that Catherine responds with what she thinks is obviously detached politeness. And it's so wonderfully wrought by Jane Austen that you can have these two completely different opposing opinions and then both be supported by the textual evidence. I think it's a great way of thinking about, you know, in your own life even, how two people can come away from a conversation and and sort of extract quotations from it and still come out with complete different ideas about what actually happened. So on the one hand, you can see why it's reasonable for John Thorpe to have thought that he has proposed to her and that she, she has been actively encouraging him. But equally, you can see why Catherine can say in all earnest uh, truthfulness, as uh, as I quoted in that conversation that she has with um, Isabella uh, that happens later in the text, Catherine, with all the earnestness of truth, expressed her astonishment at such a charge, protesting her innocence of every thought of Mr Thorpe's being in love with her and the consequent impossibility of her having ever intended to encourage him. You can absolutely see how those two paradoxical, contradictory um, views of the conversation could have come out of the same conversation because of the way that Austen um, creates uh, the dialogue between them. And the other thing I think you can see in this um, section is how Austen converts, and Northanger Abbey is all about really, how to convert the Gothic and the sort of worries of the gothic uh, and so on how so in this case that you've got this kind of unscrupulous fortune hunting man who almost seduces this naive innocent young heiress um, and how Austin draws on those gothic tropes and how she converts them comically into the everyday thank you very much indeed for listening Remember, if you like what I do here on my channel where I analyse classic literature, then do subscribe. And if you have liked the video, then do press the like button, the thumbs up button. It does help me out in YouTube's algorithm. And I would love to know what you think of the way that Jane Austen constructs this uh, scene between John Thorpe and Catherine Morland. So do let me know your thoughts in the comments below.